in today's world, this is probably the most important part of a business anymore. Hey guys, today I'm talking to Mikey Miller of Easton Outdoors, all about what he's doing on social media that has grown his business big time after pivoting from an old business model. Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Logan Schinholzer, and instead of being joined by Alex, today I am joined by Micah Miller. Micah, welcome. Thanks for joining, man. Hey, thanks for having me. This is great. So, Micah, if you don't mind, just can you give us a, a background and who is Micah and your journey up until this point? Um, so, I started in 2003 with just a, a, a actually a bicycle and a push mower. I was in high school and I just started cutting my neighbor's lawns. And from there, I've had kind of a little bit of a roller coaster of a business journey right up until um, I almost actually sold the business and got out of it. And then I was able to get some coaching help and kind of turn the uh, business around and and really get 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 back on my feet, if you will. So walk walk through the business, if you don't mind, like what what do you guys like? You know, you start off with a lawnmower, which I'm guessing means that you did long care. But now, I mean, just based off of what I'm seeing online, you're completely different. So yeah. what's been that progression of like the services and who you go after? What's that been like since 03? So obviously we were largely maintenance really until the, I would say until 2016, we were almost entirely maintenance. And in 2016, I had a guy who was a little bit tired of cutting grass and we kept on getting asked to do random stuff, pavers to little water features. And so we just kind of had what we called our enhancement crew, if you will. And they just would go around anything that I bid on that, you know, I thought that they could handle that could just start it. And um, that transition kind of took a whole new turn when we got into the uh, beginning of 2019 so just the beginning of last year and we said you know what i'm not really good at running on a on a 10 percent profit margin <laughs> that we were making in the maintenance that's just not my speed how about we just really sell every single bit of maintenance that we have and put all of our eggs in one basket in the enhancement um Obviously, what didn't just happen just like that, but that was largely <laughs> what happened is we just decided to to jump in uh, with both feet. You know, if you're if you're trying to jump off a train, you don't put one foot on the train and one foot on the ground. You just you literally just launch yourself off. So that's what we did. And I mean, largely my social media pet presence is be because of you know people like Tom Reber who have pushed me and, and encouraged me to go in a certain direction, and that's. I mean, that's, that's why you see what you see. So before we jump into social media, which is really the, the whole uh, goal of the conversation today, I've never heard a good thing about maintenance aside from people that do design build, like they actually install the work and then they maintain it because they can generally go at a much higher profit margin because they don't need to lowball their own offer to get the sale. Right. So did you see, I'm guessing if by a 10% profit margin on maintenance, you were probably in that same boat where you can't charge twice or three times as much as everybody else to mow somebody's lawn because you then price yourself out of the market. So or is that my off on that or is that? Yeah, so I mean, as a design build company, we still do take care of a couple of our clients but it's not what most people would think when you think about maintenance. So well, we do pond maintenance and that's totally different, but from a landscape maintenance standpoint, we have what we call our estate program. And I'm very upfront with anybody who wants to join in on that program. And all of the people in that program are people that we've worked for for years or we installed their landscape. And essentially we just, because we have the structure in place to communicate and manage and do things, I just am using an entire team of subs to manage their property. So we've got guys that go in and cut the grass. We've got guys that manage the irrigation, guys that um, will go in and tr treat the turf, uh, guys that go in and cut the bushes. And then we kind of maybe will step in for every once in a while, just because I have crews that are capable of that. But mm -hmm. we're able to make money off of that kind of maintenance and it's just it's a different setup than what most people would see so it's not we're not truly a maintenance company anymore 
I got you. And then with the clients that you have that you do install, what percentage of them then retain you for maintenance versus that was just like project based where they just had you one time and that's it until the next renovation or enhancement comes through? Yeah. So we typically touch about 200 clients a year. Uh, in the last two years, we've touched about 200 individual clients and we typically pick up two. So, I mean, we're talking about a 1%, you know, mm -hmm. come with us. But what we do is the guys that maintain the property, they get the business. So I have a whole mm -hmm. team. I mean, I've got like seven or eight landscape companies that I refer to. And in turn, they send business back to me. Um, so a lot of it still does stay underneath the umbrella, if you will, but it's not under kind of our management structure. Okay, so you're not actually like trying to deviate from the core services at this point to help two people every couple of years. It's really, you kind of keep them on, but I'm guessing you sub it out. So then that way you can stay with exactly what you guys want to do, which is design build more so trying to scramble a crew every so often to go maintain someone's lawn. Yeah, exactly. And what's really cool about a lot of these people who hire us for the estate program, I mean, we have uh, 13 people on that program. What's really cool about it is they their property is a uh, work in progress. So we go back in multiple times a year and do additional things for them, whether it's adding more lighting or uh, changing up the landscape or they just got bored with a certain section of the yard. I mean, they're not small properties. I mean, the smallest one we take care of is an acre. Um, okay. So yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I mean, that, that's, that's awesome that because I know I, a lot of people that I work with or talk to, they have their core values and, or their core services. And then as soon as somebody else with a, you know, some money in their hand says, well, can you do this? They like deviate and it, it takes away from, what they're good at and what they're set up to do and it right. kind of ruins them so for you was that a tough shift coming from this world of maintenance and lawn care over to design build and then saying we're we're not going to do maintenance or if we do you have to be very special or did you just do a complete overhaul of the mindset as well and say i'm good with passing off maintenance from here on out it's probably the hardest mind shift that i've had had to make i mean it the, the best thing i could equate it to is if you're driving down the road in second gear and you're like okay i'm just going to shift over to fifth gear and i'm going to make it everywhere i'm trying to go and just stay in fifth gear that was what it felt like at first you know it's just like this you're putting your foot on the pedal and it's going nowhere um mm -hmm. and you're just like well eventually i'll get up to speed where fifth gear matters you know i'll just keep working until fifth gear actually can get me the speed that i want to go but no, it, it was not a, it was not an easy thing to do. Hey guys, if you're looking to grow your business, make sure you head over to contractorgrowthnetwork.com. Learn all about everything that we can do. Websites right now are the hot thing. Everybody is at home. Get on it because this is the new way that people are buying today. Contractorgrowthnetwork.com. Let me see if I walk outside here, if it would get any better. Can you kind of walk through, I, I guess you're just to kind of recap your Facebook strategy and your mindset, because what you're doing is not uh, common. It's not, I don't, I, I constantly am comparing myself to others. I don't know if that's healthy or not, but I'm constantly looking at what uh, other people are doing. And, and at first it was like, okay, I need to mimic them in my local market. And what's changed now is now I'm looking across the country and I'm looking to mimic people across the country instead of the people inside of my local market. The, the entire goal of my social media and this is not for me this is from tom reaver so any of the ideas that i say they're not my ideas um but the entire goal of everything i'm doing is that i am the expert and they would feel remiss if they didn't hire me what do you mean by that so let's say you put out a video what is the emotion that somebody should feel from one of your posts after viewing or reading it so we we have this tagline we use often which is welcome home the the idea is your yard your home your space should be where you are able to go and unwind um, and that's kind of a external 
tagline, you know, it's time to create a waste. This is another one we use, but it's all driven by our, our core mission statement, which is we change our client's life by changing the way they live outside. So that's our core statement. And so everything kind of revolves around that core statement. So anytime we're doing a social media post or anything external, we always want to kind of portray that imagery and kind of get that idea that, hey, we are we're making a beautiful space for these for these people and we're changing the way that they're going to live. Can, can you give like like an example of, you know, you fit you're finishing up this great project and you now have to somehow craft this social media post because all your posts are like when I look at them, they're they're authentic and they're descriptive enough where it's like it 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 tells enough without telling too much about what's really going on. So when you go to craft a post, what's your mindset? Like, do you take your your mission statement and go, okay, how do I formulate whatever I'm trying to say around this mission statement? Or I guess what goes on in the brain of Micah Miller when you're going to post? <laughs> um, well, so I'm the first thing is is I'm I'm not trying to be I'm not trying to brag. That's kind of the first thing that I'm always I'm always very careful not to present like this unapproachable attitude in any of my video or social media posts. I want to be very approachable. So that's kind of the first thing. I'll write something out and I'll <laughs> I'll delete the whole thing. I'm like, okay, that sounds like I'm trying to be somebody that I'm not. <laughs> so sometimes I have to craft a message five or six times, and sometimes I'll just save it as a draft for the next day because I don't. I don't like the the message or I can't figure it out. So often the thought process that goes through my mind is what's if somebody saw this in their yard, what's the first impression that they would have? Would they would would that be a feeling of relief? Would that be a feeling of joy? Would that be a feeling of happiness? And so I kind of start from there. But I also I want people to know some of the details and the hard work that goes into it and the thought process. So I also try to expose that back end. Because I, it used a lot of people just see like the Instagram photogenic kind of imagery, and they have no clue the the thought process and me waking up at two a.m. and jotting notes down because I had some crazy idea of how to design a space. Nobody ever sees that side of it, mm -hmm. so I'm trying to expose that as well and show you know the team effort that goes into a lot of the work. And how are those posts received? So sometimes I miss it completely. You know, I'll have I'll do some posts and you know I'll get incredible traction. And then I'll do another post and I might get five or six likes or comments. But I don't care because there's no such thing as a bad post when I'm keeping those kind of core things in mind. I'm still popping up in people's news feed and whether they scroll by it or whether they stop to put a like on it, I'm still front of mind. So there's no failure in my part. And, and that's really one of the issues here that a lot of people don't post because they're afraid of what if I only get one like, what if I only get two comments and the comments just happen to be from, you know, my wife and my mother-in-law <laughs> or something like that. So were you instantaneously like, okay with, you know what, I'm just going to post and I know it's going to take a little bit of time to gain some traction. Or did you have yeah. to kind of overcome some of those like demons of, God, I hope somebody likes this one. I definitely did. That when I first started going on camera, when I first started putting myself out there, that was probably the, that was not probably, that was one of the hardest things I've ever done because I'm looking at myself in the camera. I'm like, I don't, I, I don't sound good. I don't like what I'm mm -hmm. talking about. I had this whole thing that I was going to try and talk about and this direction I was going to try and go on the video and I just completely lost track and I have no clue what, where I was supposed to go because I just saw myself in that little, you know, square video in the corner and I was like, who is that? And it's like, yeah, get, get him out of the screen. So after a while, you just get comfortable and you kind of now, I mean, people just will just say, okay, I really like the way you describe that. And so that it just builds on itself. So I'll like put that in the back of my head. I'm like, okay, next time I make a video, people seem to respond very well to that. So it's definitely like a building block type thing where over time you get more tools, you learn how to talk just a little bit more, you learn how to be more succinct and how to start videos. And I just, I'll watch other people's videos and I'll pick up little things and on YouTube or Instagram or Facebook and I'll pick up little things and I'll change my styling all the time just to try and you know keep evolving and keep moving forward.
Are you able to uh, to watch or listen to yourself at this point, or are you still at that point? Like, cause like for me, it took me a while to like be comfortable hearing my own voice. Yeah, I watch every single video that I record, every single one, without really? fail. Typically, as soon as I'm done, I watch it again, and I pick myself apart. I my own, my worst critic is probably what somebody would say, but I listen to the whole thing, I pick it apart, and then I try to get better on the next one. Sometimes I'll listen to it a couple of times. Oh, that makes me cringe. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I said that or whatever. And then I'll just listen to it again and like cringe again. But it seems like the ones, the videos that are most cringeworthy are the ones that get the most traction for whatever reason, because they, they're probably the most authentic, but they, they definitely seem to be the ones that get the most traction. Yeah, that was something that there's a podcast I, I listened to, like one of my friends was on it and the person who does the podcast edits out every single filler word. No ums, no likes, all that stuff. And I guess it makes the podcast go faster, but I, I do know that there's a bit of science behind you build rapport with people that have the same speaking patterns as you. So that was something that I had to kind of get used to where interesting. I don't do as many filler words, but what I do is I just talk and talk and talk until I figure out, oh, this is how I want to finish the sentence. And it's kind of like a Michael Scott where I like wrap it all back in together at the end. Cause I like I'll start a sentence without knowing where it's going to end. And it typically works itself out most of the time, but I've just got yeah, used I to just it. Watch that episode where he goes to um, the office, uh, Wallace's office. And he's like, so tell me, tell me what you're doing. Why are you so successful in business? And he's, he's like, yeah, I always start a sentence and I don't know where it's going to end. <laughs> and like he had like the sentence, like always do this and always. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah I, I know exactly. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. But that, that's effectively how I've done it. And I like have to now, if I feel airtime, I just like kind of repeat myself. But it, it's getting to the point now where I realize just like an awkward pause in a video doesn't always do good. So it just it's a lot of practice. Um, but I, I've probably done. I would say at least a thousand videos at this point between all the YouTube stuff, all the Facebook stuff, this kind of stuff. So yeah. it, it took a while, but for you, how, how long did it take you to get comfortable actually shooting a video and putting it out there? So we started doing this in April of 2018. That was the very first time I heard Tom Reaver say, Hey, you need to be posting three times a day. And I was like, what the heck? There's no way I'm going to be posting three times a day. There's no way I can even come up with that much content. So I just started like, okay, I'll do, I'll do a couple posts and I'm going to just grab some content and I'm going to kind of highlight some content. And he really was, you need to show the work. And I remember watching Alan Decker showing off some of his work and I was like, I can do that. And so, you know, the first video it's, there's nothing in the video it's all forward facing and i'm like look at this and no, or mm -hmm. no fingers pointing at all it's just the video panning and me awkwardly talking about hey look at this and then that kind of progressed after about 10 videos i kind of was getting to flip the camera around um after about 10 more videos so now i'm at 20 videos i was comfortable enough where i can start the video and end it and kind of get some transitions going i'd say by video 30 or 40, that's kind of when I started to get into some momentum. So we did about 50 live videos in fall of 2018. We did about 70 or so in 2019. And to date, I mean, we're already at, I think 70 to date this year. Um, I've got a board on my wall. I can't remember where it says we are, but yeah. So we, we, we track all of our live videos because maybe that, doesn't have a direct correlation. I'm not saying causation or correlation is causation, vice versa, but it does seem the more content, the more live content we push on social media has a, you know, we can almost tie our sales directly to those and our views and everything. So yeah, it, it, it definitely took a while. I would say by video 50 that I was pretty, pretty comfortable, but video 40, I started to get into my, my zone. So if you don't mind, walk me through like some of the results that you're seeing. I mean, you're, you're getting a lot of views, but how has that turned into sales? Are people watching the live videos and then calling you up? Is it they saw a video a year and a half ago and now they're calling you? Can you kind of walk me through, I guess, what you're seeing on, on your end from a business side, not just from a how many yeah. people saw it on Facebook side? Yeah, that's, that's probably the most important metric, right? 
sometimes it's not, you know, we have a CRM and we track all that stuff, but sometimes, especially when, now that we're doing like the Facebook pixel and retargeting and stuff like that, you know, sometimes like, well, we just found you on Google. And it's like, well, you know, is that actually the case? Did you actually find me there? You know, and, and you kind of have to, you have to dig a little bit deeper and figure out where they first found you. Um, but the, the direct result that I've seen is we've made ourselves stalkable. So we've, we've kind of opened up the doors. Here's the good, the bad, the ugly, come in and take a look, you know, here's our failings, you know, I'll post stuff. We messed up on this. We did that. We're having to make this change. And so I just have really, Hey, we're, we're a transparent company. Come and check it out. So when somebody stumbles across us on Google or, or Facebook or a friend shares one of our, our videos, it kind of, it's I'm very long term in all of this. It kind of brings them, if you will, into that sphere. And so as soon as I can get them onto my page, I know that I'm going to start showing up and I know that they're going to start seeing my content. So it's, I, I don't typically expect once somebody likes my page to see something in a week. I don't even expect to see something in six weeks. I don't expect to see something sometimes even within six months. But what I do hear all the time is, we'll, we'll make a couple of different scenarios. So scenario A, somebody just found me on Google. They went through my website. They went to my Instagram. They went to my Facebook. I'm trustworthy now. They don't need references. They don't need all this. You know, they, they just found me, but because they're so, I mean, I've got thousands of videos on my face. I probably, I think I've got literally like 1,100 videos on my Facebook page. So they can go and they can watch whatever they want and they know that I'm a trustworthy source. So let's talk about a person A. So the other day I get a call from somebody. She said, I have a question for you. I know you don't do this, but I'm looking for somebody to do a screened in porch. <laughs> and I said, okay, you know, tell me a little bit about it. Asked her some qualifying questions right then. And I said, I've got just the guy. And so I told her his name and everything. And I said, so tell me real quick, how did you, how'd you find me? She's like, I knew you were going to ask that. And she said, as soon as you picked up the phone, I knew it was you. I, I saw one of your trucks in my neighborhood last week. And last night I looked up your company name and I stayed up way too late watching all of your videos on your Facebook page last night. And as soon as you picked up the phone, I recognized your voice and I knew it was you. And I just, I, I knew I could trust you. So I figured I'd give you a call and figure out who I should have to come and do this deck in my backyard. And, and when I'm done with that you're coming in because we need some other stuff done after all that's done so like that's person a like as soon as they find me they can get all this content this whole world of content and you can't scroll to the bottom i can't get to the bottom of my own page so mm -hmm. that they, they can just keep going and going and find something different something new person b you know this would kind of be like a crs on a disc profile they're going to need to do a lot of research they're going to need to kind of envelop themselves and this is a long-term process because maybe they've been burned by a contractor in the past uh, maybe they just don't trust easily or maybe they need to know a lot of information before they hire somebody so by constantly creating this content and having this machine that's always rolling and always fresh and we repost stuff every once in a while but for the most part i try to make sure i never repost the same picture i just repost something from a different angle or a different you know, whenever I take pictures, I take 50 pictures. So none of the content is ever reused. It's just this constant cycle of pushing forward and putting out new stuff. So after a while, they don't trust anybody else because they've seen me for the last six months to a year that they're like, okay, I know he's expensive because I've gone to his website and I see his pricing. I know, he, I know his pricing generally. So when it is time to finally make that call and finally get that, make that decision, I know who I'm going to, going to hire to do the work so it's a it's definitely that's more of a long-term type client um but we get those all the time that's that's people come they we've been watching you for a year and we finally decided this is what we're going to do so with that first scenario with the lady that she's watched the videos and then she calls you up let's say she was ready to go she didn't want to screen and porch she actually wanted some you know she wanted a pond and a patio in her backyard how much easier is that sale where you know that she's already watched hours of your videos versus if she's somebody that just got your number off the internet and now she's calling you for the first time? It's, you don't even have to try. I don't, I mean, I don't know what, I don't, I'm not trying to sound cocky or whatever, but you just don't have to try. I mean, you, they typically they know who you are they and i talk about our process and i typically will talk about even pricing on our facebook page to some extent i'm not 
like crazy talking about it, but I'll talk about pricing on our Facebook page. So they, I mean, they have an idea of who we are and they more or less know our process. So when I get on the phone with them, what have you seen that you like? Oh, I like this. And I saw this on your website and then I like that. And okay. So you're looking for something like that. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. You know, that was a $15,000 job. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so you go from having like boiler room people or like Wolf of Wall Street convinced them that you're the man to now you're effectively just, it's your job not to mess it up. Let them know what logistics are going to happen. And that's that. Yep. So I had a guy call me. This was um, about three weeks ago. And he, <laughs> he calls me up. We did some work for his neighbor down the street. He went on and did the, you know, the person A scenario, completely stalking me to figure out who I was. And he calls me up and he's like, is this Micah? And I said, yes, sir, it is. He said, um, so I have to ask you, this is, a, this is a serious question. I have to ask you, did you pay people to write all those reviews on your Google profile? Or are you actually that, are you actually the, that good? And I was like, well, I mean, I didn't write any of them. I didn't pay anybody to write any of them. What, what do you think we should do? And he's like, <laughs> Okay. He's like, all right, we're ready. And so I just went over there. They, I mean, they already knew, they told me right off the bat how much they wanted to spend. It was just a little $6,000 job that they didn't want. They were like, we can't go over this. And here's the things we want. And I was like, well, we can't do these three things, but we can do these four. And I had a signed contract in the first meeting. That, that's what, it's so funny that you talk about that because that's something that premier has always been good at is because of their videos, they sh would show up, they'd say, Hey, I'm Mike. And the homeowner's like, yep, you know, you're Mike, you're TJ, you're Nilo. I, you know, I've seen all y'all's videos. Like the trust and rapport is already there. And then when I talk to like, for example, like Sherwood, you know, the number one reason why people hire Dan is because they love Dan. And I'm like, Dan, yep. if you're the number one reason people hire you, why not do more videos of you talking and you just being Dan? And it sounds like I'm guessing, Mike, that this is a huge thing that you've kind of taken on is if people are, are, are hiring Easton because Micah is the one kind of spearheading a lot of it, why not make Micah, the number one salesman, be out front? So by the time they do call, they're putting all that trust they've built with all your videos with your voice over the phone. And it's like the sales already at the two yard line. You just have to like walk it in. I do. Yeah. The I would agree. Dan definitely needs to start doing videos. It's. But it's one of those things. I mean, it's it's a humbling thing to do. It's not, you know, if you're if you're alpha dog and you have to go kind of down like six levels and start from, because it you don't it's not something that you just are all of a sudden good at doing videos and you're all of a sudden you look good on camera. And I, I still don't think I look good on camera, but I'm still going to do it because obviously somebody thinks I look good on camera. <laughs> yeah, it it really it does. It it takes it's a couple of notches that you're going to have to. Like I, like the first 20 videos is for you. It's it's you figuring out your own voice. When you listen to it, you're gonna realize that your voice is much higher than you think it actually is. And that's just or it's nasally. the way that's yeah, it always sounds terrible. <laughs> and I'm like, but I but I really say that, and then you just get over it. And then because I know for me, whenever somebody calls me and we start talking, and I say, Well, you know, what do you know about the the process? And they'll say, Well, I've listened to your podcast and I've watched a lot of your YouTube videos. For me, it's it's much easier. It's a much easier conversation. I think they feel better because now they're not talking to a salesman. They're talking to somebody who they've spent six, seven hours listening to their stuff over and over and over. And then from a sales perspective, right. it's I just can't they, mess it up. They already know you. They already know who yeah. you are. I mean, they're already like it's I mean, it when you say the word stalkable, I mean Truly, that's what we're, we're trying to be as upfront and open and out there as possible so people can actually stalk us and get to know us. And when that trust is there, whether it was, you know, them sitting there with their podcast, listening to your voice in a dark room, I don't care. They still get to know who you are. It, it makes a huge difference. And like if you're a larger organization that maybe you have salesmen, like to me, that's who should be out there as well on these videos because absolutely the voice the voice connection is huge because like Mike if they're watching your videos and they then hear your voice versus let's say Evan's voice even though Evan's in a lot of videos I can only imagine it's that much easier to instantly for them to feel at home yep it's and it's true and and part of the reason you know we have Frank he's starting to kind of get into it a little bit more 
he's our service tech and we have Evan and he's the, the lead installer. Um, he eventually he'll be superintendent where he's just managing the projects. So he'll start doing more of the kind of the videos as well. Um, but I'll always do the intro video and then we'll probably start having Evan do the transition video or the finishing video. But it's, it's so true. Like people, they, they get to know you, they get to know who you are. And, and Evan does videos because people will be like, Oh, you're Evan. We've heard so much about you. We watched a couple of your videos. And so like, they, like he's very much in it and very much a point man as well. And so him having done videos and any other salesman, if it's the, the salesman's job, if they so, if they sold that job, they should be doing the video on that job. That's that's I'm of that opinion. So how did you get this culture over there of Evan? You're going to do videos. Was this something that he asked for or did you kind of appoint it to him? No, I definitely appointed it at first. Okay. I mean, it's not like, it's like, hey, I want you to go out there and make a bunch of videos, you know, or it's like, that doesn't just, you don't, you don't just automatically want to just make a bunch of videos. But because as a company, we track it and we can see the results. And as a company, we, our goals are intertwined. You know, our, we, we've set our goals as a team. Mm -hmm. We're achieving our goals as a team. And so that means that everybody wants to, buy into the goals as a team as well so they're not my goals they're everybody's goals and so when that whole culture is revolved around the same goals it's i really i mean i occasionally i'll be like hey i need you to go out and do a couple more videos like hey when you close that out and i'll like we'll be on uh, hey when you close out that job just make sure to put a video out there for us because i'm not able to be there or you know they need to see this or it's been a while since you did one or whatever reason and so they'll jump on and do one He's going to be the longest one to get into the whole swing of it, but I think he's going to be the best at it. He's 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 in his like uh, twenty videos right now stage. You know, not even. I think he's at fifteen videos. So he's starting to get. He's almost got the point where he's about ready to flip the camera around. <laughs> getting there, little by little. It's like he goes no camera, little by then little. finger, and then you eventually just you know you, you kind of build into it. <laughs> Yep. So let me let me wrap it up with yep. this question. How important is it, you as the owner and the leader of the company, for you to be on video instead of just asking the guys to be on video? So, I, I, at a point, at a point, you have to be you have to take charge and you have to be in the front. You need you can't just delegate something as personal and as um, uh, important. I mean, this is. In today's world, this is probably the most important part of a business anymore. If you're spending, and by the way, we spend very little on marketing, like extremely little. Like Tom's always like, hey, you need to be spending like 10%. Okay, maybe not 10%, 5%. Okay, at least spend 3%. And I'm still like, I think we spend 2% on marketing, and that includes wrapping trucks and all of our online marketing and everything. But I put out all my posts, and I put all my energy into our social media platform as far as our marketing goes. It, if I wasn't the one doing it, we would have almost no traction because it's my baby. I've taken ownership of it. And because I have that passion and drive and because I realize the importance of it, that's when the team starts to get aligned with that. And, and eventually it'll take off on its own. But And I won't have to do anything to get it going. But for now, it's it, it has to be managed. And it has to, if you just sub it out to some company and just have them manage it for you and put generic photos online or don't ever show the face of the employees like that, that there's no soul at that point. They don't, they just see pictures of your work and this is nice. Okay. Whatever on to the next. But if they're like, who's that weird looking dude with round glasses or whatever, what's he got to say? And they, they like, mm -hmm. and there's a ginger as well. And like, what does the ginger have to say? And there's a guy who you never see behind the camera. This is interesting. I don't know. You know, like once you kind of, get that personality and people can get into it that's you, you have to as a point you have to be the point man and kind of take the charge on it yeah you got to eat your own dog food and i kind of realized that like with our culture here like you have to be comfortable on camera so whenever we hire we actually make people send in a video response of you know we ask a couple of basic questions but we try to like when i ask the questions i do it on video myself so kind of like tries to break down that barrier and then uh, for yeah. us we have people that will say like i don't feel comfortable doing it on video can i email you the responses and i'm like that's we're just not a good fit then because 
this is a, I mean, we're literally a video company first and then everything else. So it's really right. market shared and ask where it's media, but for us, it's even more specifically video because we do a lot. Right. So it's helpful. So, all right, Michael, any final parting words on Facebook and how to grow your business using posting every single day? Well, posting every single day. <laughs> I mean, how many, that's, that's it. How, how many, let's say, hours a day do you focus on this? It's not even one hour a day. Um, it's just so automatic now. And the way my phone is set up, every single job that we do, I put them in individual folders. So, I mean, I have, I have hundreds of folders on, my, on the cloud. And it's all different jobs broken down. And I prioritize all the ones that are more photogenic and keep those towards the front. So it's sometimes if it's like we don't have a live video for the day or we don't have something, I just go, I'm like, this job was interesting. Grab, okay, there's 100 pictures in this folder. That one looks good. Quick edit, post, copy over to Facebook. I don't ever let Instagram post to Facebook. I always go and post them separately. And I try to give it a little bit different tag each time. So, I mean... Maybe maybe 30 minutes posting and then maybe maybe an hour, maybe 30 minutes responding to comments. And I respond to every single one uh, and make sure that every single thing has gotten responded to. Micah, thanks for joining and uh, sharing some of the secrets, man. Yeah, thank you for having me.